Hey guys, I'm Jacob. You're watching the Preppers Bunker Outdoors. Today we are here with John Farnham of Defense Training International. John, I am so glad to have you on the show. I am so uh, proud to have you here talking with us today. We are going to talk about going armed. Make sure that you stick around. This is going to be a podcast that you're going to want to see. Welcome Inside the Bunker, a Patriots podcast sponsored by the Preppers Bunker Outdoors, Beach and Tactical, and Exodus Knife and Tool. Well, uh, Jacob, it's my honor, and uh, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you for inviting me. It, it is absolutely my pleasure. So, uh, Mr. Farnham, uh, you, have, you run Defense Training International, a uh, training school that teaches people how to shoot. I am a, uh, I guess you'd call it an independent consultant. Uh, I, uh, run training courses. I teach all the classes myself. Uh, I don't have a staff. I, uh, well, my wife, I guess you could <laughs> put in that category. She tries to keep me out of trouble, but I, uh, <laughs> I teach, I teach the courses myself. Um, I also, uh, provide uh, consulting services to attorneys on, uh, uh, shooting cases. And in some cases, provide expert testimony, what's called an expert witness. But it's, uh, uh, and that's both in the civil and the criminal area. Uh, but most of my time is spent teaching. I much rather work with students than with lawyers. <laughs> so, Understandably. Understandably. Uh, but that's another another aspect. And I'm down here in uh, El Paso, Texas right now, uh, teaching uh, several courses. These are the last the last two courses of the year. And then, as we discussed earlier, next year starts right up again with a shot show, and and I'll be out at uh, Tactical Response in uh, Tennessee, and uh, in February. And uh, so, well, I, I'm, I, took uh, a, I took a class with you at Shot Show, and I don't remember if that was 2018 or 2017. <laughs> I went with uh, James Yeager and Donald right. Burgers and Nate. It was an amazing time. Your class was fantastic. It was a vehicle tactics class. Yes. Um, so you have four books written, is that correct? Yes. Uh, I've written several books. I I really need to write some more <laughs> if I get around to it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I uh, the reason I do this, the reason we do this, uh, as we discussed earlier, there's no money in this. Uh, I do it because I find influencing uh, the next generation, influencing other people, I find that exciting. And uh, I like I like to think that I've influenced people in a positive way. And that's that's why I do it. And as you can probably tell, even uh, during our brief uh, discussion, uh, I would make a poor employee. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I would never hire me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I guess I have to be an independent consultant because I'm not sure I could do anything else. Yeah, I feel I feel pretty similar myself. I'm in a similar boat. Now, uh, 1968, you went to Vietnam with the Marine Corps. You, uh, you got three Purple Hearts. I don't know if the correct terminology here is that you earned three Purple Hearts <laughs> or you received. I'm not I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. Uh well, it's not something I uh, look forward to, of course. No. But uh, when I was there, I think uh, seventy-five percent of my OCS class uh, were killed, uh, and everyone was wounded. Uh, I know guys that have five Purple Hearts. Uh, you're not going to be in a high-intensity environment like that and not get hit by something, right? And so I was just very fortunate that I lived through it uh, through no fault of my own, uh, and. Uh, but it was just a lot of people. We had a lot of casualty every day. When I was there in 68, uh, we had contact every day. Wow. Uh, we, we were in contact every day. And uh, uh, it was exciting and, of course, exhilarating, very dangerous. And uh, I'm lucky I lived through it. Absolutely. Thank the Lord. Uh, you went from that to law enforcement eventually? Is that yes. Correct? Yes. I, I uh, you know, got out and... Uh, went to work for the family business and uh uh you know my my family was very kind to me but uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew i didn't want to do this the rest of my life so right. uh, i became a police officer in uh in wisconsin and uh 
work full time for a number of years, and then, and then I got a wild hair, and uh, uh, I guess I, I should give you the background on this. When I got back from Vietnam, I wrote a paper called "Living with Guns," where I tried to point out that in training in Quantico, we were taught how to operate a number of weapon systems, small arms and all the stuff that infantrymen would operate. And um, and we learned how to operate it and the steps and all that. But no one ever told us how to live with them and have them around all the time. Uh, you know, uh, the, the military was as gun phobic in those days as they are today. They're scared to death of guns and they're scared to death of gun accidents. And so uh, these commanders are so risk averse in training, of course, uh, uh, you don't get much opportunity to to live with guns as you would in a in a uh, wartime environment. Well, when I got over there, I found uh, that uh, holy cow, these guns are never unloaded. Uh, I remember the first my first night in country. I was <laughs> they threw us right to the wolves. I got in a helicopter and flew out to meet my platoon. I didn't know anybody. Uh, they were out trying to rescue a helicopter and. Uh, uh, it was already dark when I got there, and uh, I remember being in a in a shallow ditch watching tracers crisscross over my head. And I remember saying to myself, "Who's in charge of safety around here?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then it, you know, suddenly occurred to me, "Oh, I'm right. not back at Quantico, am I?" And so uh, I thought that issue would just not address or certainly not addressed adequately. And so I wrote a paper. You can imagine the reception I got. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but um, uh, that's why today we run hot ranges and, you know, and we uh, encourage people to get used to these, having these weapons around and being capable all the time. Well, when I became a police officer, I went to the academy and it was the same thing. The same thing all over again. The blind leading the blind. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, I, as I say, got a wild hair and decided I could do better. And so I started consulting and running courses for police departments and others. And of course I like to starve to death the first few years, but, uh, uh, that was, uh, 40 years ago and I've been doing it ever since. And, uh, uh, I'm now, I will be 78 years old in February. Uh, but, uh, I'm having too much fun to quit. There you go. <laughs> so, so. um, so James mentioned something and, um, you know, I don't want to quote him, but I believe he had mentioned that you were one of the first, if not the first people to go from military and law enforcement professional experience to taking these things to to teach civilians. Um, what Can you clarify that for me at all? Well, I'd say, you know, Jeff Cooper probably has that honor. He he's uh, he was in the last generation. Uh, and I, uh, Jeff Cooper, and I, I think Ray Chapman had some law enforcement experience also. Uh, but I was inspired by that and uh, decided that uh, uh, there are a lot of people who own guns who uh, shoot themselves on a pretty much daily basis by accident, of course. And uh, most of that is preventable. And then I saw people being convicted and prosecuted uh, just for, not really for crimes, but for just inadvert inadvertent mm -hmm. ignorance. And so uh, I made that kind of the core of my, my instruction now. I just uh, looked at the news this morning. On Black Friday, Americans bought enough guns to arm the entire Marine Corps uh on one day yeah so uh a lot of those guns are going to sit out there in the hands of, of non-police and they're never going to be fired they're going to stay in the box they came in for the next 20 years yep. uh but uh a lot of them are going to be involved in accidents and uh the vast majority of those accidents are preventable uh and they happen because of ignorance it's yep. just ignorance uh and so that i try to address that that's, I'm down here in Texas uh, doing this class now, trying to, I've got a bunch of doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs and, you know, other professionals. Yeah. Uh, and they're all very intelligent. It's, it's, not a, it's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter of ignorance. They just don't know. And when they're involved in a shooting, they don't know how the criminal justice system works. 
uh, what to expect. Uh, and all that uh, I can bring to them and inoculate them in advance. And uh, I take some pleasure in thinking that maybe I prevented an accident. Uh, maybe I've kept an honest person out of prison. Uh, and uh, so, again, that uh, we certainly don't do it for the money, but uh, that's I do it because I think uh, I may be helping people. Well, so with what you've just said, with the topic of our discussion being going armed, I, uh, I don't want to quote you, but you said something that was very impactful to me in training or to us, the class, I should say, rather. Uh, and I believe it was on along the lines of, uh, you know, your firearms handling will, is not safe. There is risk yeah. involved, but it's calculated yeah. risk because you are taking a calculated risk to be safer when the time comes that you really need these skills. Can you elaborate on that maybe? Or very good. I, I'm well, sure I butchered it. No, your, your translation was very, very good. Uh, the way I, I sometimes put this is that um, it is our, in this generation, it is our honor and privilege to use these wonderful you know, killing machines that have been uh, uh, designed designed by amazingly talented designers and uh, taking into account the experience of hundreds of years. And uh, and now we get to use this stuff. Yeah. But they're deadly weapons. And I that word deadly, I, I like to use because the, the guns are designed to be deadly weapons. And... Uh, only politicians talk about safe guns. Right. Uh, I remember when Kalashnikov was, you know, rolled his eyes and said, safe gun. It's a gun. It's not safe. Right. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> they understand that a lot better than we do sometimes. Right. Uh, but the way I put it is, I don't think it's possible to handle a deadly weapon safely. I don't think that's possible. I think we can handle them carefully. But no matter whose procedure you adhere to, mine or anyone else's, when you want guns in your life, risk attaches to that. But as you pointed out, risk also attaches to not having guns in your life. Mm -hmm. In the end, we don't get a risk-free life. And in the end, the bacteria win anyway. Yep, uh, between now and then, uh, we balance risks. There's no risk-free decision we can make. Uh, we were taught, we try to reduce risk exposure. We try to avoid ridiculous risk, right. but, uh, some risk attaches to nearly everything we do. And as I say, you want guns in your life, a terrible accident may be in your future. That's possible. No matter how careful you try to be, no matter whose instruction you take. Uh, but I think in training, we can make that very unlikely. Absolutely. Uh, that's the best we do. But I don't like the word safe because safe implies a guarantee. Right. And your students will come to you. You know, that your students come to you and say, show me what I can do. That when I do this without fail, nothing bad will ever happen. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, we have to smile as you just did and, <laughs> and say, well, uh, <laughs> you're talking to the wrong wizard. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh so that's the way I try to put it uh, so students understand that uh, uh, this is not a risk-free endeavor. And I, as I point out to them, you're in a training exercise there. You're in a dangerous place. Right. Uh, this is a dangerous place. Uh, and then I point out uh, you were in far more danger driving over here uh, on right. a public highway than when you're here. But, uh, but risk is relative, but it never goes away. And even among experienced instructors, we have accidents as you know. Yep. Well, one thing that I liked that you said is, is these are tools designed to kill or they are deadly. And so one thing that has always bothered me is people who use a defense of their firearm ownership of it's not a weapon. It's a tool. It, it, it's not a salt yeah. rifle. It's a, it's a modern sporting rifle. All of these <laughs> things all of these things are giving a message that says, because I'm telling you it's not meant to kill, I should be able to own it. Where That's right. the reality is, 
I should be able to own it because it is meant to kill because I have the right to defend myself. So it's a self-defeating argument. Yes. It's how we're they... going to lose the government's support of our God-given human right to own and carry these firearms. And that's a good way to put it. Uh, when I testify on a shooting, uh, particularly a police shooting, uh, I can almost guarantee I, you're going to get this question. I've answered it many times. Uh, Mr. Farnham, in a normal course of uh, good police work, were your police officers ever point their guns at innocent people? Now, you can see the, the purpose of that question is what? It's to put me on the defensive, right. to, to get an apology. Oh, well, we no, no apology is necessary. I say, yes, we do that. Uh, and that's part of good police procedure. It's regrettable, but it's unavoidable. Yep. And I think we have got to stop, as you pointed out, we have got to stop apologizing. Yep. No apology is necessary. No pandering. Uh, yeah, it is a, yeah, those guns are meant to kill. You bet they are, and damn quick. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you how to use it to its maximum effectiveness just for that purpose, when it's necessary to protect your life. Uh, no apology is required. And uh, uh, we have to stop letting these liberals uh, put us on the defensive. Uh, I don't need to defend the fact that I'm not anxious to die. Right. Yeah, and 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 uh, the other thing is, if I am not going to allow the government to own me, then I am not going to allow them to choose when I'm going to die or not die or whether or not I have the right to defend my life against somebody else that they own. I'm not theirs. I'm mine or more specifically I'm God's. But uh, people take this, this stance of you didn't have the right to X, Y, and Z with this other person. You used too much force. I'm not speaking as a lawyer from any kind of legal perspective, but I'm going to any threat to myself or my family end the problem as absolutely quickly as possible because any time that I take above and beyond that, any measures that I am afraid to take uh, are just increasing the risk to myself and my family that I did nothing to deserve anyways in the first place. Yeah. Uh, that's a good way to put it. The sovereign citizen is, is a principle upon which this country was founded. Uh, we're all the inheritors of that from our, their, the, our founding. Uh, when they put this country together, that was one of the principles, that the uh, citizens are sovereign. Uh, and uh, modern day, uh, you know, leftist communists are working toward, as you pointed out, getting us used to the idea that um, uh, we exist only to serve them. And uh, that we are expendable cannon fodder and uh, our lives are important. That's why they keep insisting they need guns and bodyguards, but we don't. See, it's a, it's a, they're a special class of citizen. Their lives are important, ours aren't. Uh, they don't articulate it in just those terms, but that's how it comes out, isn't it? Yeah. Just why are you so worried stuff. about your life? It's not important anyway. Uh, the only life here that's important is mine. And uh, that's what we get from uh, leftist politicians. And like you, I resent that. Absolutely. I resent that bitterly. I'm an American citizen uh, and I'm a sovereign citizen uh, and I don't exist to serve politicians. Absolutely. And I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's perfect. Um, so, uh, Defense Training International, I took vehicle tactics with you. You have handgun yes. courses, carbine courses. Right. What what, uh, what do you specialize in? How often are you traveling? What would you like to tell potential students who are looking to come take a class? Most of my students these days are non-police. They're mostly professionals. Uh, as you know, my, my MO is uh, uh, I charge a lot and I have small classes. I don't like big classes. My tests are usually between six and 10 students. Uh, uh, I have the reputation of a high price vendor uh, because uh, I like serious, I don't have time for non-serious students. And I don't, not interested in people who don't know why they're there. Uh, people come to me because uh, uh, they're willing to sacrifice and they're interested and they make good students. 
And uh, the thrust of my uh, instruction is uh, we talk about the operation of a machine, of course, this this pistol. But as I tell my students, if you can operate a toaster, uh, you can operate any gun I know of. Uh, none of these are particularly complicated. It does, we can teach chimpanzees how to operate guns. Yeah. Uh, but we need to know about the environment you live in. This, uh, uh, what we laughingly call the criminal justice system. Hmm. What kinds of things you can expect, the attitudes you can expect on the part of prosecutors, uh, the angles from which the prosecutor is going to come at you to weaken your case, uh, and the things you need to do to be, as uh, our colleague uh, Andrew Baraka puts it, uh, be hard to convict. Uh, be so hard to convict that the prosecutor says, well, you know, I don't like guns. I don't like gun owners. I don't like this person. But, you know, we don't have a case here. And uh, we're, we don't have a case we can win. And so uh, maybe you won't go to trial. Uh, maybe you won't be convicted. Uh, typically, uh, people are convicted on criminal charges after they use guns for any reason. Uh the chief piece of evidence that convicts people is statements made by the accused at the scene. Yep. People absolutely. don't know what to say. They don't know what not to say. Uh, they say a bunch of incriminating things. And of course, we're all wearing body cameras now. Right. And when you say something incriminating, I can't pretend I didn't hear it. It's all recorded. Yep. And uh, those are the kinds of things that send people to penitentiaries. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of this that needs to be covered. And then with that in mind, we go to the range and uh, uh, we practice verbal challenges. Uh, we practice verbal disengagement. Uh, all those things you need to know in addition to just knowing how to operate the gun. And uh, so that's been the, the thrust of my my training here lately. As you say, we run pistol courses and shotgun courses and, and rifle courses, but even in our, uh, our, our rifle or carbine course, if you prefer, uh, it's relatively close range. It's within 100 meters. Uh, because uh, whether no matter what weapon you use, you still have to have an articulable threat that you can describe. Mm -hmm. Past 75 meters, I can't even tell what I'm shooting at. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think it's wonderful that people go out and do these curious exercises in academic accuracy and, and shoot rifles at six, seven thousand meters and all that. As an academic exercise, that's it's interesting, but it's irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, it's nothing that you're going to use in any kind of serious situation. I like to stick to the serious use of guns. I have no interest in competition, any kind of competition. Uh, I, that just leads to compromises. We talk about the serious use of guns for serious purposes. Well, and I like that... Uh... And a lot of people confuse uh, firearms proficiency with tactical proficiency. So Thank you. they're they're out there. Everybody's practicing reloads on a square range without practicing taking cover, without practicing moving. They want to see how fast they can reload. They want the shot timer. And you could be Jerry Mikulik, uh but you could find yourself in a shooting where you don't need to be Jerry Mikulik. You smoke the guy, but you go to the prison for the rest of your life. Did you win? Right. right. Or you I don't could call know how to be proficient and safe with your firearm. You could know what to say and how to say it. And you could right. smoke the bad guy and you could go back to your family. Um, uh, and I would say from a military background, all of these people are training reloads and speed but if you don't know how to use cover and if you're not constantly thinking about improving your position and moving from cover to cover, how fast you're shooting is probably irrelevant. And uh, it's a good point. A fight avoided is far better than a fight won. Absolutely. Well, and a fight most, avoided is a fight won. Yeah. Most lethal encounters in which you're, you might get involved between now and the end of your life are probably avoidable. Are probably avoidable with uh, when you look at your lifestyle, the places you go, the people you associate with, the kinds of things, even the, the way you dress. Uh, we, uh, uh, I think, uh, most of that stuff is uh, is avoidable. As I tell my students, uh, when you get involved in a lethal force encounter, 
on the sidewalk in front of the drunken monkey bar at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> how much sympathy do you think you're going to get from the jury? You know, how, how sympathetic do you think the jury is going to be? Now, is it illegal to stand on the sidewalk in front of the drunken monkey bar at 1.30 in the morning? No, that's not illegal. It's just not smart. Right. And uh, so I talk a lot about, I don't talk a lot about what's legal and what's illegal. I do talk about what's smart and what's not so smart and what's to your in your best interest. And so uh, the place you go, the people you associate with, you want to go armed, you're going to have to look at that and see how we have to tweak that a little maybe to make a lethal encounter uh, not impossible to be sure, but less likely. Absolutely. Now your point, and you know, when the shots start going, uh, now uh, I have to look for ways to not get shot. Right. And using things like movement, like cover, uh, and tactics like that to make it less likely that I'm going to get shot. And maybe when I find a strong position, uh, my opponent or opponents will see their position as untenable and uh, go and do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, if they decide to uh, run away uh, uh, and not shoot or shoot and then run away, I consider that uh, a fight one. That's I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I no know. Matter, no matter what, no matter if you kill all of the bad guys on the planet, if you die and you don't go home to your family, did you win? Uh, well, yeah. That's an interesting it, philosophical it question, but it depends on <laughs> yeah. the context, of course. But yeah. but I do I do military training. I have worked with military units, but most of my training is with non-military, non-police. And uh, uh, as I explained, you as you just pointed out, uh, our job is not to rid the world of evil. Uh, you're not going to be making arrests. Uh, you're uh, you're not going to be gathering evidence. You're not going to be doing anything police do. What you need to think about is, what can I do to keep from getting hurt? That's the, the first question to come to your mind should be that. What can I do to keep from getting hurt? Right. And of course, the, the best answer to that is, number one, don't be there. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, the second best answer is, get out of there. Uh -huh. You know, when things start going downhill, uh, get out of there while you still can. Uh -huh. uh, so often people, they, they see a fight or they see a loud argument. Ooh, let's go over there and see what's going on. You should be going the opposite direction. Yeah. I don't really care what's going on. Uh, I do know I'm too old to get hurt. Uh, and, uh, uh, and nor do I, I want to be a witness. Uh, I just want to get out of there and not be involved. Be as far from the legal system as you can. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, this brings up a, a moral question, of course, and this is something we instructors have to address. I'll explain all this to my students and, you know, what, as your lawyer, I'm trying to tell you what is, what's in your best interest. Uh, and uh, so what's going to make most sense is don't be there to begin with, get out of there uh, and don't get involved. And then, of course, invariably a student will raise his hand. Well, you know, Mr. Freiman, that's all fine. I understand the logic of that. But um, when I see something terrible happen, my conscience will not permit me to remain silent. And my response is usually, God bless you, bud. Yeah. You know, I'm not here to tell you what to do. Right. I'm here to tell you what's going to happen when you do. Yep. Yep. Uh, when you're aware of all the consequences likely consequences then you sit down in front of a mirror and have a discussion with yourself mm -hmm. you know of how uh, what you think you need to do i'm just here to show you all the you know make you aware of how the system works or doesn't work <laughs> and uh what you're going to expose yourself to and what the likely consequences are you're you're going to have to take it from there absolutely absolutely well, um, Mr. Farnham, thank you so much for doing this video with me. Your links will be in the description box below. Um, I, I I don't know if I should say this or not, but I used in my videos in the past, uh, you know, I told people to go attack a response, but I said, but go to Defense Training International or go to Clint Smith first. These guys won't be around forever, a little bit 
ironic at this point, sadly. Um, um, but the the fact remains, I think that uh, that you are an absolute uh, asset to the community. And I would encourage anybody to go train with you. And another one thing that James said also, James told me that you should charge people to take you to lunch because they would learn sitting and having a meal with you. And that would be worth their money to do. Well, if anybody wants to take me to lunch, uh, consider I have accepted the offer. Yeah, so. <laughs> I'd love to, but on your comments, I would still go to Tactical Response. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, James, James has died and, and he was a wonderful friend and, and, and a colleague. But the school is still going. Uh, his uh, son-in-law is very competent. He's got a competent staff there, and you will be doing yourself a favor to go to Tactical Response. I'll be there in February doing a course uh, that they're hosting. Uh, and uh, uh, But there are a lot of other uh, very good instructors out there. That, and my suggestion is, as a student of this art, come to all of us. Uh, I... Uh, my, you'll have my web page on there. If you want to go to my web page, you'll see my schedule for 2023. I'm delighted to have any of the people listening to this come and join me. But I'm not certainly not the only one. There are a lot of wonderful instructors out there, and I hesitate to mention them because I'm going to leave someone out, and then <laughs> their feelings hurt, you know. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, there are uh, there all, we're all friends. I mean, they're all dear friends, and I guess we're competitors in a way, but we're all still good friends, and we steal from each other shamelessly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what we're trying to do as a group, as and I include you in this. We're trying to advance this art. Uh, the body of knowledge uh, that we've discussed here today, that we teach, has been gleaned at enormous price. Uh, and when we allow this to atrophy and not refine it and not advance it and not preserve it, then a whole new generation of Americans are going to have to die all over again learning what we already know. Yep but didn't pass on. Yep. So that is our charge. And I intend to pursue this as long as I can. Well, thank you so much for coming on again. I, I, you are a professional and a gentleman. It's absolutely been my pleasure. Uh, guys, uh, whether you go down to tech response in February or you catch Mr. Farnham at any of his other classes around the country, please do so. And go to tech response as well, as he said, certainly. Um, it's, it's been, it's been a wonderful video and I just can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. And for my viewers, I will talk to you guys in the comment section below. Have a blessed day. You too. And, uh, Jacob, you're, you represent the next generation. Uh, you're going to be doing this long after I'm a distant memory. And so if I can influence you a little bit, uh, I'll consider it a good day. Well, uh, I couldn't ask for better influence. Thank you.